Welcome, everybody, here at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center of CUNY in Midtown Manhattan. It's a cold day in New York, but a sunny day, and it's an important a day. Today is January 7th. It's the Holocaust Remembrance Day, and to honor um, this day and uh, all that uh, is connected to it, we uh, are today presenting a live reading here on Zoom in English, Mother's Courage. He's a great, 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 or was a great, great theater artist, uh, Hungarian, German, much beloved by his actors, a great writer, a great mind, someone who worked with Bertolt Brecht, wrote it for Hitchcock, had his own theater company, and um, also was a very, very gifted uh, director in one of the most beautiful pieces I've seen were directed by him, and I also knew him a little bit, so it's a great, great honor. Today we have with us two actors um, who um, have dedicated part of their lives to the work of uh, George Tabori and his uh, great play, My Mother's Courage. We have with us Sigrun Schneider-Kittner, who will be the mother in the play, and Thomas Bockelmann, who is going to be the son. Both of them work at the Staatstheater Kassel, where this production originated. It's their first uh, Zoom reading ever, um, and um, I think also of the Staatstheater Kassel, the first uh, live one. We are very honored um, to have them uh, with us. Uh, we are doing this in collaboration also with the National Jewish uh, Theater Foundation, NJFT, the Holocaust Theater International Initiatives, um, um, which is based at the university uh, in uh, Miami. It's an important uh, uh, institution that keeps us uh, uh, alert on the fact that we have to uh, remember. And um, as someone said, it is important to learn from history that we don't learn from history. So it's uh, good to be uh, reminded uh, from that. Our partners are Torn Page, New York, where this production uh, will be showing throughout uh, this year, the Synagogue Center in Felsberg uh, in Germany, and of course, the uh, Staatstheater uh, Kassel. We're very uh, um, honored that uh, we have this uh, collaboration. A little bit about the play. It is based on the true story of the legendary theater artist George Tabori, the writer, he, the memoir of his Jewish mother, who miraculously, and in great act of personal courage, managed to escape deportation in 1944 in uh, Budapest. Uh, and now uh, we are going to learn how Elsa, this kind of unwavering Hungarian Jew who stayed in the city to take care of her asthmatic sister, uh, we're going to hear how what happened. And uh, we're also going to see how George Tabori thought about telling a story um, so we all remember of what is important and significant and meaningful. And as a warning, how fast things can and will change if we don't pay attention. So here we go. Um, we, we have the reading. Um, uh, Thomas and Sigrun, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. yes I'm see, there. See. I think you are in you are in Europe. You're in Spain at the moment uh, uh, on an island. And thank you. What time is it? Where are you? Uh, it's uh, five o'clock. We are in Tenerife. It's one of the Canary Islands. Fantastic. Um, fantastic. So um, then let's hear George Tabori, My Mother's Courage. Here we go. Uh, Sigrun, can we start? Now? Uh, yeah, people are waiting. Oh, I just, mean, just, you should you should put on your, your glasses. Le, le, just a second. Yeah, but I put on your glasses. glasses. You can't read oh, otherwise. Oh, sure. Here so, I am. Can, I can we start? Yeah. yeah. You sure? Thank you. Sure. Okay. <laughs> My mother's courage. courage. One summer's day in the year 44, a vintage year for death, my mother put on her black dress. The one with the lace color. Um, the one she always wore as befits a lady for her weekly mm -hmm. gin game at her sister Martha. It was 10.30 a.m., just in time, like ever. Yeah, these uh, little attempts to accuracy. <clears throat> uh, she also put on her black hat, wax flowers around the this rim, and a pair of white gloves the left thumb mended. No. God resides in small details. Wax flowers around the rim? Correct me if I'm wrong. I can't remember wax flowers around the rim. Um, that was a black straw with a white, white silk. silk ribbon. I, I know, Mother, oh. but wax flowers around the rim sounds better. Yes, my darling, it does. 
<laughs> there she stood looking at herself in the mirror with those incomparable blue eyes no, no, of no, hers, no, 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 no. which were to save her life no, that no. day and let out a groan as it was her custom. Uh, uh, why don't you give us an example of that famous crown? Here? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there was always something to groan about. Debts, yeah. measles, oh, yeah. infidelities, yeah. Uh, cousin's bronchitis, uh -huh. yeah. burnt meat, yeah. the absence of two sons. Yeah. Only this time she had greater reasons for groaning her husband. Who happened to be your father at the same time. Had recently been arrested mm -hmm. for what he was. A Jew. And a Marxist of the reformist movement. That in addition. A man caught between doors, as it were, languishing six weeks in a jail temporarily. Set up at girls' school. Uh, yes, uh, our fascism. No, no, of, no, uh, there. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, their fascism was rather poor one, a rather poor one, quite shabby in comparison to the neighboring pomp. The green shirts of our local thugs were greasy at the collar, their boots unpolished and their guns frequently jammed when dug into the necks of their victims. Listen, Oditsky. Oditsky, for instance, used to wear a mixed pair of boots, one brown, one black, as he kicked your father down the stair. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, having groaned and uh, blown a wisp of hair out of her eyes, another one of her habits, my mother packed mm -hmm. her purse with her customary objects. Keys, a hanky. A chapstick. A snapshot of her two exiled sons. Oh, wait, wait, wait. What is it? I brought it for you. Listen. Grinning under an almond tree in London. But that's really cute. I give it back, please. Okay, okay. Um, mm. A postcard from her husband, written in jail, asking for clean underwear. And, and Pascal's pensées. A tin penguin in case she should lose a gin, and an apple for emergencies. Uh, an apple, me, with my poor teeth. Correct me if I'm wrong. Plums, more likely. They were sweet this season. Okay, plums. Oh, plums. Uh, then she left quickly through the back door in order to avoid the chibotniks. Can't you leave them No, out? no, that's oh, impossible. Please. They are important for the story. A fish-faced family of fascists who were occupying by government decree three of four rooms of our apartment, including the boys' room in the back, where I had lost my virginity to a saxophonist's shabby wife. To whom? To the wife of the saxophonist. You didn't know that, oh, did you? Oh, oh, but you were only 12. <laughs> so what? Uh, people of this sort, Shibotnik had said on arrival as he and his fish-faced brood were standing awkwardly about crates and boxes, do not deserve such luxury. Uh, he was referring to, my, to, to the spaciousness of my apartment, not my initiation into manhood. His wife, <laughs> though she believed that Jews were fond of drinking the blood of Christian babes, would sometimes show small signs of charity, leaving a pot of goose fed or a few apples outside my mother's door. Plums. The son is leaving the table and playing a little bit on the piano. What's that? A modest musical effect. The piano? The piano, oh, which piano. stayed in the confiscated part of the apartment was used by the Chibotniks for storing Kenneth food. My mother, however, had used it for as long as I can remember to express some love and hope. Correct me if I'm wrong, mother, but in all the years that I have known you, you learned to play with difficulty only one song, a, a German one. Uh, my last memory of it being a one finger version in the dust. In times of stress, when I had scarlet fever, or your husband came back from the war frostbitten. You sang this German song, sometimes unaccompanied. You held my hand for his until one day, the day I believe, when you sued the yellow star on the breast of your good black coat, 
you stopped singing it altogether. Jewish pig. When she walked out into the sun of the open corridor crossing the courtyard of the tenement, she was aware of the little eyes peering at her from behind curtains, still curious at her transformation officially decreed from dear neighbor into stinking Jew, Jewish pig. A red cunt. Stinking Jew, Jewish pig. Dirty Jew. Stinking Jew, Jewish pig. Jewish cunt. The only person who did lose her hatred with verbal insults was the janitor's wife. This was Miss Boschbergel. A froggy creature who croaked the latest fashionable curses from the gloom of her lodge, like... Red cunt! Or... A Jewish pig! My mother's response was merrily a Semitic sigh, as if to say, well, what do you expect? Well... What do you expect? Or that's the way it goes. That is the way it goes. The girl's words followed her into the street like a putrid. Stinking Jew. And evaporated in the sun. Mm. She stopped for a moment to enjoy the summer on her face and continued past the grocer's. <laughs> he no longer waved at her through the window. The barbers who ruined your first haircut. And the drapers now shuttered, for he too had been recently arrested. Mm -hmm. By the time she had crossed the patch of grass along the coffee bar, the coffee barrows, th that you remember that. Well, I once wept teenage tears on the velvet oh. lap of my first two lives. In again. Uh, she was followed by two policemen, mm -hmm. called by the barber to check her out. Uh, Tabori, said one of them, dropping the missus so to assert his authority. Yes. Uh, follow us and don't cause any trouble. Oh, anything wrong? You're under arrest. What, whatever for? Whatever for. You're being deported. No. My mother asked, implying the absurdity of all arrests, and in particular this one on a sunny day en route to a weekly gin game. Well, what do you expect? So that was the way those days in my hometown, Jews and non-Jews alike, people facing disaster with equanimity. There was no place for panic or indignation there, not after so many sunny days of disaster. Well, that's the way it goes. The three of them stood for a moment in the sun, looking away from each other. Klapka and Iglodi, the two policemen, were in their 70s, recently recalled from retirement for their fascism. No, 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 no. no. Ours, but, ours. But, but that's the way I, was an understaffed kind of fascism, mm -hmm. nervous about the fact that there were more Jews reds, liberals, faggots, and other criminals than policemen. These two should never have been called back into service. Klapka had asthma <laughs> and Iglodi the gout. Besides, they had never been any good as policemen. Klapka had bungled several ARS and Iglodi. <laughs> Iglodi, while beating up a communist girl, had broken its thumb and thus became the loving stock of force. <laughs> uh, they stood for several seconds without saying a word. Finally, my mother looked around for the police car, mm -hmm. but there was none to be seen. Not Klapka to be seen. and Iglodi, not to mention my mother, were too unimportant to be provided with such luxury. So they escorted her to the tram stop to catch the, the number six. six. That would take them to the West Station, where a train had already been assembled with 20 odd kettle cars to accommodate some 4,000 deputies. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. Yeah, the weather. The tram was clouded and nobody got off. The, nobody got off. The policemen, not knowing how to be both inconspicuous and assertive, gapped at the woman conductor who was leaning casually against the door. Stand back there, said Klapka, not very loudly. Stand back where, asked the conductor and did not move. Until my mother looked up at her with her incomparable blue eyes. Him again. The conductor responded by bumping some of the riders 
with her hips, opening a gap mm -hmm. and helped my mother up mm -hmm. the steps. She creased into the crown crowd that stood stiffly entwined as if in a vertical mass grave. Vertical mass grave, stiffly entwined. You think that is good? Don't you like it? No. Mm, okay, I cut it out maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, Klapka, snapping for air, could already sense disaster. Iglodi, who had never forgotten the mockery of his colleagues, decided to abandon the instructions about acting inconspicuously, fumbled in his pockets and produced the handcuffs, his credentials, as it were, and said after a while, state police. <laughs> but the conductor had already rung up the bell and the tram began to move. Iglodi, rattling the handcuffs, put a big foot on his, the moving step. And stumbled against the lamppost. <laughs> Klapka, trotting after the tram, stuck out the curved top of his cane. I grabbed hold of the cane. Yeah, you were really never able to resist a uh, gesture for help. The tram was gathering speed. Klapka's head flew up. He let go of the cane. And wheezing with asthma, called out like an elderly lover. Wait for me at the next stopper. <laughs> Holding high the detective's cane, my mother turned to look at the crowd for advice. Rigid, blank, shifty, their eyes were turned away, squinting down at the floor or gapping through her as though she were made of glass. The word state police had condemned her to a sort of leprosy. True, no one tried to push her off the tram, but she had become dirty to them, or what was worse, invisible. Only the conductor moved, handing her a ticket without waiting for instructors, instructions and said lethargically, <laughs> naming the last stop. And my mother realized that she had been given free of charge, mm -hmm. an invitation to escape. Mm -hmm. Yet instead of waiting for her over the hill prosecutors at the next stop, she was free to ride on and get into hiding and why actually didn't do so uh, what you go into hiding <laughs> but how does one go into hiding at the age of 60 when you're a lady wearing a good black dress with a good black head with wax flowers around the rim and where in the hills under a bridge his sister's house where she could easily be tracked down and endanger even more innocent people. Most of the family had already been dispersed or disported. And some, like cousin Clara and her diabetic child, had already been turned into smoke over Poland. My mother had long since given up asking for help from her Aryan friends. After her husband's arrest, they had become contaminated accomplices to the abomination on Tuesday morning when her husband's arm has been wrenched behind his back, his gold rimmed spectacles hanging from an ear as they led him out of the bathroom, bedroom where I was born and kicked him downstairs. Don't worry, was all he had said, a remark both heroic and stupid. That was not all he said. Correct me if I'm wrong. He also said Elsa. Elsa. No, like a child. Was it embarrassing? <laughs> not to me. <laughs> and the woman conductor whistled a popular tune as she shouldered her way through the crowd. My mother stood, ticket in one hand, cane in the other, paralyzed by what her husband would call the incompetence of good. It was an adventure that demanded goil and strength, but my mother had never had an adventure. Hey, 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 hey. Ah, except Stimply. for the one with her golden lover. <laughs> no, 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 I tell this now, your own fault. As she would call the cavalier lieutenant, who years before her marriage kissed her after a dance on her eyelids. And on the mouth. Pardon me? On the open mouth. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. I thought all her life, even as a child, she was a mother. 
seeing to it ah, Jeff, his that, filial, that of innocence. the apartment was warm, the coffee strong, mm -hmm. the meat tender, and the boys properly dressed. Mm -hmm. But these skills were of little use now, where she would have had to behave like Lenin, or better, like Douglas Fairbanks, her idol. Oh, the thief of a Baghdad who would spring from roof to roof. And so, mm -hmm. at the next stop, she said, see you again. See you again. To the blank staring riders and got off to wait for the detectives under the big clock, the favorite meeting place for her lovers. They arrived on the next tram, certain that I had gone off into yes. hiding. That was a wise decision, Klapka said, handcuffing her. Tell me, my mother said, embarrassed by the attention they were getting under the big clock, where are you actually taking me? To Auschwitz. Where? To the Jewish bakery. Oh. Oh. Under the great glass dome of the West Station, crisscrossed by the sort of sunbeams seen in cathedrals, my mother was cast into a hysterical mass ballet, whose choreographer, a German officer, was seated incongruously in a plush armchair, reading a book and paying no visible attention to the inefficiency of his servo workers. Green shirts, policemen, plain clothes men and railway men were going berserk, trying to organize the exodus. The deputies, snatched out of some less trivial activity like my mother, found themselves transferred into a cacophonic nightmare they had been haunted by for some time. A ritual butcher, his cleaver still dripping blood. A group of schoolgirls in shorts and track shoes snapped from the middle of a gym class and a young man in pajamas, his lips rimmed by a toothpaste. Four or five white eyes patients wearing the beach garb of an insane asylum and a rabbi with a buttered roll and, and no shoes. Having recovered from the first shock, they were driving the tormentors crazy by requests that sounded insane because they were so normal. The lawman rushed up and down the platform and tried to push, shove and kick the crowd into a straight line so they could be pressed inside the cattle cars whose side walls had already been lowered. Excuse me, sir. May I use the telephone to inform my wife? Forget it. Where could I fill this Thomas bottle with tea? No idea. Have you any idea, sir, how long it would take us to get you there? No. Do you have a pencil, sir? One at a time, you rats. Would you be kind enough to mail this letter to the chief rabbi of New York? Kiss my ass. Is there a dining car on this train? Not so loud, you dogs can't. Might I borrow your head, sir? So I could pray. Shut up, shut up, shut up. I'm not a Jew. I'm not a Jew. That this chinless wonder of a green shirt actually freaked out, screaming on top of the baggage cart, shut up, shut up, shut up, and fired a shot in the air. The German officer, who had been unraveling a handkerchief, blew his nose, got up, and said, not very loud, quiet down, which went like a wind through the crowd and hushed everyone. <laughs> a fine lyrical observation, my darling. Are you making fun of me? Not at all. Only, well, I told you a story and now you're telling a story. How can two stories be said the same? So why don't you tell it? No, no. Uh, try it. <laughs> Even as a child, you would turn things, I mean life, into stories. I always admired you for that. But? But how could a person, especially a child, live his life and on the very same time turn it into a story? I always admired you for that. I can't tell you my story. What I did remember for your sake, so that you could turn it into a story, I've already forgotten. All I can do is to correct you now and again, if that is what you want. Yes. Because 
You do tend to exaggerate well, and again. embellish, my darling, and only very little of it was as beautiful as you now make sound it. For example, I can't say much about sunbeams and cathedrals at the West Station. I just stood there quietly looking around for some friends, minding my own business and hoping that my good behavior would be favorably noticed and perhaps assure my release. <laughs> a very foolish hope. If you are a good little girl, everything will turn out all right. That was the golden rule of her life. A rule as realistic as the prayer of the little old man who, for want of a hat, was covering his head with an aged speckled hand. My mother tried to ignore him. What eventually caught her attention with a pang was another train. Two tracks away, about to leave with passengers on vacation. Another more familiar chaos was shaping the scene over there. Overpacked carts followed by suspicious fathers. Carheinz. Pulling in their way into crowded compartments. Panically, mothers wondering whether they had turned up the gas. Children with sailboats, beach boats, and stuffed dolls with parents screaming or slapping them. Carheinz. Partir. Partir. C'est mourir un peu. Oh, this was no the only French my mother knows. That's not true. What is it? The Beaujolais primeur est arrivé. But now applause for Elsa Tavori from Budapest. Yeah, she found herself sunk in reveries. Vacation images of the past came to her mind, and she and she thought she saw her husband wearing a cocky boating cap, a cigar a slant in his mouth, trying to cover his incapacity for travel by belowing at porters, ambling about losing tracks of the luggage immediately, uh, leading and leading his, his family to a carriage reserved for a clergy. She envisioned the two boys in their sailor suits getting lost and found in the nick of time in a first-class compartment, swapping fantastic stories of high adventure. She pictured all the long summers by the lake with peeling noses, mosquito-infected suppers in the garden, afternoon promenades, and making love on a sandy sheet. And then, from one minute to the other, so it seemed she was inside a cattle car. How time flies, my darling. Squeezed together with some hundred, two hundred fellow travelers, her feet slightly off the floor, and as the side wall was hoisted and bolted, shut in darkness, expect for a straight line of sunlight light filtering through between two loose planks. What's that? The darkness started moving. The rays of sun between the loose planks lit up a few human parts, as if the deputies had already been dismembered. A hat, a hand, a hooked nose, a pair of wet eyes, fluttering hair, all of it belonging to different people, yet embodied by a single mutilated giant. As the train had settled down to an event trot, even trot, and the foul air was freshened up by a country breeze, this fairy unison breathing changed to a different kind of gasping. Cows and sneezes spread diseases. Someone remarked humorously and was rewarded by a giggle with conjured up the atmosphere of a children's zoom at night when the children enjoying furtive jokes under the covers while the grown-ups danced above a fairy tale. But no one would be safe from getting baked in the oven except for this one. Would the lady on whose foot I'm happened to be standing if you reveal her identity signify displeasure? Ho, ho, ho. Take off your hand off my hip, young man, not you. Hey, hey, hey. Ach, ich hab sie ja nur auf die Schultern geküsst. The kitschy folly of the aria was counterpointed to the prayer of the rabbi with no head. Some god you are. Where were you this morning at 11 when they broke my glasses? Out of a snack, taking a nap? Well, I'm through with you, boy. Do me a favor and choose some other people next time. 
unwilling to pray. My mother was relaxing by then. The darkness surrounding her began to assume a shape. The fragmented pieces would be observed. Someone to her left smelled of slaw wax, another had wiry hair, a third wore bleached rough linen, a fourth was sweating through his shirt. But where were the children? Up to then, my mother seemed to stand on the bottom of muddy waters, another one of those wretched metaphors. <laughs> Doesn't matter. But now there were buttons, knuckles, earlobes, shins about her. And then, to her astonishment, a hand was moving up her good black dress. Now comes what you call the, the love story. Yes, now comes what I call the love story. Aren't you ashamed of telling it? Yeah, of course I'm ashamed. That's why I'm telling it. But I'm your mother. <laughs> yes, you are my mother. But is it or isn't it true that in the darkness of the cattle car, the the hand was moving, as I said before, up her good black dress and stopped shyly before rounding her left breast. At the same time, the chin settled on her shoulder and stayed there. She blushed and moved an inch forward, but the hand, with its arm cornering her from behind, Clasps, clasped, clasped her breast firmly and pulled her back. There was a body belonging to that hand, leaning humbly against her backside. As she made her last attempt to free herself, the voice whispered into her hair, Please, it will be the last time. The hand released her breast to show its respect, waited and rested, on her breast again, two fingers caressing her nipple. Well, such is life, my mother had almost, almost said. She said nothing, for the hand was pleading in a child manner, asking for help rather than seeking to make requests. My mother could not remember when her nipple had been last played with. She was almost 60 then, and sex to her had become an unpleasant chore that she had put aside with other childish things. For a moment, she thought about her husband languishing in prison. What would he say? They had never discussed such things. He was prude. One time he had ordered a cousin out of the apartment for using the word testicles in front of my mother. The last time he had slept with her was eight years before, I think in a Corinthian spa, on the squeaking mattress of a white hotel set in the middle of fir trees. I say, I think, because as a rule, sons have a peculiar romantic idea about their parents' sex life. At least that's what my son tells me. She liked to feel her husband's weight, I think, and the way he called her, my little Elsie. His bald pate burrowed into the pillow when he came, I think. She had never had another man in her life, I think. And now in the cattle car, the body belonging to the tender but anonymous hand was pressed against her buttocks seeking entry and release. No one had ever made love to my mother standing from behind, not even her husband, I think. She wasn't quite sure in the cattle car on the way to Auschwitz, how it could be done, if at all, through her good black dress. And yet, the two bodies picked up the rolling rhythm of the train and her breath also had quickened. Above his chin, resting on her shoulder, there came appreciative gasps and another plea. It's the last time. So she bent her knees and opened her bony hind cheeks to a warm spray that stained her good black dress. The little Robbie's prayer had never ceased. After a while, the hand released her breast, the arm and the chin parted from her. Her heart was blessed with a kiss, and the body behind her wriggled away. She never found out who her lover was.
When they had stopped near the border at the gate to death, as the saying went, to change to a German cattle train much cleaner than their own, my mother was surprised by the strong rays of the sun. I thought it had already become night. But no, it was still day, and the travelers, 4,031, plopped out of their confinement into a lazy afternoon. The train had shifted to a side track next to a golden field. Peasants were loading hay. A horse buggy was kicking up the dust of a lane. No one paid attention to the travelers except for a baffled child behind a bush sucking his thumb. There was no terror in that landscape. The weather was fine. The work going well, the bird flew from a tree. It would have been a pleasant evening and the doomed passengers passed by like characters who had wandered into the wrong play. True, an invisible dog was barking hysterically. It must have been chained to a post. A metallic clank accompanied the barking. And that barking, my mother says, could be heard through the rest of the afternoon. Let me go, the dog was saying. Aptly put, my darling. For a while, nothing happened and no one spoke. Then a young man, squirming as if his crotch had been wet, stepped forward to pick up some red poppies and was shut. He fell down and died quickly. Only his fingers moved a bit like a baby rocking for a nipple. My mother had never seen a man being shot, and the shot was sufficient to restore perfect discipline. The message was clear. No more of the hysteria that had prevailed at the West Station. The quiet command was heard from the direction of the engine. The deputies began to walk obediently, their steps crunching the gravel, passing the same German officer who had been sitting in the plush armchair at departure time with his back turned to the travelers. He watched the loading of a hay cart. The green shirt surrounded him, puzzled by his interest in the hay. Hurry, hurry. One of them shouted to demonstrate his efficiency. The German put up a gloved hand to hush him as though he was anxious not to disturb the peace of the afternoon. The deputies walked around the engine and crossed the tracks, passing the German train. They seemed to be led by no one but themselves. And they continued to the country lane, which was bordered on both sides by more red poppies, until they got to a gray rectangular building with a tall chimney. That building did not blend into the landscape and ruin being a ruin itself, the view. It was abandoned. It was an abandoned brick factory with weeds and gold manure all over, broken windows getting down into an open courtyard the size of a football field where the dog chained to a post was barking. This courtyard was like a stage that was set up in the heat of the day by the three green shirts who placed a table and an armchair in the middle, a pile of dossiers on the table and a rubber stamp. They waited restlessly. One of them threatened the dog and finally kicked it, but the dog did not stop barking. Finally, the German officer made his entrance, was chewing something. He sauntered to the table, but did not immediately sit down. His audience was all around, peering down through the open window of the factory. The deputies, having milled around in the empty storerooms and bakeries, past crumbling shelves and ovens, were finally drawn to the windows and stayed there staring down in the yard. For they knew in their bowels that they would not remain spectators long and would sooner or later, later have to make their entrance. Uh, yes, there's nothing like stretching a metaphor. That's it's what you can. <laughs> <laughs> the German sat down and took off his gloves. His hands seemed exceptionally white. He picked up a dossier. One of the green shirts tried to explain something and was hushed. The officer began to read. He was reading. The spectators knew about them. Occasionally he looked up as if trying to connect 
a face with a name. But how could one identify a Mrs. Krauss or a Mr. Altschul among 4,000 odd faces, more blotches behind crime and spider web? Yet every time he did look up, many felt personally looked at and stepped away from the window. Very perceptive, my darling. It must have been about three in the afternoon. My mother, not easily entertained, began to feel bored and had somewhat of a guilty feeling about being bored. How can one dare to be bored outside the gates of hell? She started to walk around, hoping to drum up a gin game, or at least a piece of paper so she could kill time by writing an explanatory note to her husband. Curiously, she wasn't worried, which as was her custom about being away from home. Now here is a nice little psychological detail, my yes. Yeah, I mean, as a rule, you did not like being away from home on a holiday, for instance, fearing that your world and the people, the objects, the heartaches in it would not survive with your orderly touch. What on earth would happen in my absence to Cornelius or with Cornelius' socks or Clara's bronchitis or the dust on the windowsills? Would you have taken care? I was only 12. Oh, yeah, you were only 12. But her arrest made her a victim, so to speak, freeing her from the obligations of her daily existence. For example, she always felt a little guilty about playing cards in the middle of the day, just, just as she would never allow herself the luxury of a cup of tea or a coffee or even a movie until after she had done her best to save her tiny world from cars. But now, as she walked around the Crumpf factory and finally descended to the grounded floor, a decision that was to save her life, she thought she had the right to enjoy the frivolity of a card game. There were more people downstairs and they stood in crowded rows by the windows watching the yard. She picked her way through them, muttering apologies like a late comer in the theater, and found herself in what used to be the stuff entrance, an empty hallway with nothing in it except for the faded security instructions on the wall. She read them for lack of other entertainment, no smoking, no spitting, no riot, until a shadow fell on her and turning around, she bumped into Alfredo Kellen. Good God, is this Miss Tabori that I see before? I don't believe my eyes. <laughs> this Kellerman was one of my father's followers, a prominent member of what was known as Tabori's Pity, Pity Club. Club. And like all other members, not only unsuccessful, but untalented as well. What are these no good nicks doing dropping ashes on your best rock? Her sister Martha would quite rightly ask. Out of liberal guilt, my father had always pursued a career of charity. During the course of years long past after the days of his firm belief in Marxism. He collected a bunch of nebbishes, nebbishes, nebbishes. Whose claim for charity lay precisely in their undeserving. No effect. one else had paid attention to these unworthy. And that was sufficient for my father to stick up with them with the impeccable instinct of a professional Samaritan. Once on a Sunday walk, I asked him why he wasted his time on those bumps, bumps and he said, only, Only the unloved deserve, deserve loving. This Kellerman was the worst of the lot. A fat, light, little zombie, goo goo eyed, with a cold cigar rotating in his toothless mouth. His farts would stink before they could be heard. Did you hear them once? Even that. He also passed, passed himself. As a hypnotist, do you remember? <laughs> but could not put anyone into a trance. Not even my son, not a grandmother. And one time he told us he was a black belt carrot master and extended his proof, his iron stomach for a blow. And when you hit him, he fell down like a bowling pin. The moment he recognized my mother, he told, turned pale out of fright. Mrs. Tabori, God heavens, I don't believe my eyes. What are you doing here? What do you think I'm doing here? 
taking a vacation. But you are not supposed to be here. I know I'm not supposed to be here. No one's supposed to be here. No, 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 never mind the others. But you, Mrs. Tabori, the wife of the Cornelius Tabori, what are you doing in these shitty surroundings? Look around yourself. Is this an appropriate dwelling place for a lady with an incomparable blue eyes? It's filthy, it's inhuman. The toilet facilities are appalling. The catering is beyond contempt. How could you permit yourself to be handled in such manner? How dare they? What has got into them to put the wife of such an eminent humanist into this pig state? How could I permit them? What do you mean, Kellerman? How could I permit them? This is insane. You must go immediately and lodge a complaint. Tell them in no uncertain terms. Inside of being released, insist on being released and returned to your home at once with a written apology. Oh, now see here, Kellerman. No more excuses. Go out there into the yard and tell that German officer enough is enough. The time is for pussyfooting is over. Your patience is exhausted. Make him crawl in dirt. Oh, but Kellerman. My mother was getting annoyed at his naivete until she realized that his eyes glimmered with insanity. Using his not so iron hard stomach, he gave her fast little shoves toward the glass door that opened into the sun. Tell him, he yelled. The whole thing is a mistake. Tell him to let you go, dear madam, or he'll end up inside Byria. He had already opened the door, pushed her out, closed the door behind her and leaned against it with all weight to stop her from coming back. There she stood at the edge of the yard, a cruelly long way from the table and the chair in the middle. She could feel the eyes of 4,000 people upon her. She was quite alone in the sun. She had never felt lonelier. So she began to walk in her good black dress and her good black head with wax flowers around the rim and her white gloves, the left thumb mended, clutching her purse with the apple in it. Plums, my love. I've seen a few of acts of court courage in that wall. For instance, the petting charwoman trapped in a basement window after the first attack of you two bombers, four stories of brick and mortar crushed her slowly to death. Her one free hand, the only thing of hers that was free, wiggling through the window as we were trying to dig her out. No hurry, boys. I've been holding up this blooming house all my life, she kept saying till dawn when the blooming house finally buckled over and buried her, her free fingers dying, a warm death or Sergeant Kaufman, unlikely name for hero, who would cross the English Channel twice weekly in order to collect samples of German concrete along the Normandy coast. He was caught and literally skinned alive and yet refused to say a thing to his torches except for, you're wasting your time, gentlemen. Uh, his brave time uh, came after the liberation back in East Grinstead, suffering 77 skin grafts until he looked like a rotten turkey. I'm told that tomorrow, he told me shortly before he died, they will replace my upper lip with a piece of my asshole. Uh, something like this shouldn't happen to a master of Hegelian dialectics like me. <laughs> Those uh, one more of his oblique jokes referring to Marx's desire to turn Hegel upside down. Those two come to my mind now. I've forgotten many others, but I must praise my mother's courage as she walked away from the safety of numbers, separated herself from the anonym anonymity of being one of 4,000, 4 million, 40 million warm bodies. We all have stopped counting the dead, though they make the earth explode. Among them, she had felt safe. She could hang on them in ultimate solidarity, even though they would be let into the fire. But walking toward the table and the chair, three green shirts still hoovering around the German, their backs 
to her, the dog still barking, the sun still fierce, she felt she had left the banality of life and was traipsing, dog-footed, towards some incredible punishment, which now, by the first time, was as tangible and stinking as the goat shit beneath her shoes. 8,060 eyes accompanied her walk and condemned it, she felt. She had abandoned them, all by Kellerman's push and shove, and had become a traitor. Anyone who has survived these dead people is a traitor. She felt as if she were naked, and I can see her walking naked across the yard. And this nakedness becomes the measure of her courage. Who has ever seen my mother's nakedness? Not even her husband who preferred to make love in the dark. And as for me, the only time I saw her naked was in the time of my birth and then my eyes were closed. She was deep inside the yard when the Germans saw her approaching between the green shirts. Their eyes joined together miraculously. True, my mother felt like ducking and hiding but the only safe place in the world was in his eyes. Her head felt empty. She had no idea what to say to accuse her brazenness. The green shirts noticed that the Germans' gaze had become stuck in distance. They turned. The smaller of the green shirts, whose mustache hung like snot under his nose, began to bark. God, I'm Jew, bitch. What do you think you're doing out here? My mother did not know how to stop. Excuse me, sir, she said to the German. Get back in there! Snotface screamed. Now, just a minute. The German interrupted him. But the green shirt did not know how to stop either. All his life, he had wanted to scream at woman like my mother and take orders from no one. But all the day, he had been taking orders from this German who smelled of lavender and never raised his voice. Now both of them have had enough of each other. And in that tuck in of war, my mother began to sense her salvation. Get out of here, you cunt, or I blow your stinking head off. One moment, please. If anyone is going to scream around here, it's me. She had, has no business here. Let me decide that. What can I do for you? I'm not supposed to be here. Now, what do you mean you're not supposed to be here? I have a protective passport issued by the Red Cross. <laughs> That's a good one. What's so funny? If the lady has a valid passport, she shouldn't have been arrested. That's what I mean, sir. May I please see it? Unfortunately, I don't have it with me. <laughs> Snotface let out a guffaw and sprung triumphantly into the air, slapping his knee like a Hitler caricature. Stop it. But, madam, if you do have a passport, you're supposed to have it on you all times. I, I know. I'm very sorry about it, but it couldn't be helped. No. What do you mean by it couldn't be helped? Well, it's like this. My husband and I have been issued a single passport. My husband is in jail. Another misunderstanding, but let's not go into that. He has the passport with him. I hardly ever go out. I wouldn't dare not without the passport. But this morning, my sister Martha called she was not feeling well and has been suffering from epilepsy. She asked me to visit her and play a little gin, and I couldn't very well refuse. I mean, who would let her only sister suffer a fit without the comfort of a little gin game, what happens to be the only thing that calms her down. <clears throat> but anybody could say that. This lady is not anybody. Nobody is anybody. Everybody is somebody. Okay. Are you telling the truth? Yes. Do you know what's going to happen with you if it turns out to be a lie? 
Yes, said my mother. Now, the entire situation was reduced to these two pair of eyes and her gaze clouding over with some ancient anguish tried to signal to him, well, son, what can you do to me? Cut off my breasts? Hang me up for the birds to pluck out my eyes? Burn me alive? What could anyone do to me that would be worse than my naked walk across this yard. All right, put the lady back on the train and let her return to the city. See that she gets something warm to eat. He could not bear the gratitude in her eyes, so he turned away quickly. Yes, that's right. Next to the engine of the cattle train, there stood an ordinary train. She was put into a first class compartment. The moment she was left alone, her legs began to tremble and she wet her panties. Uh, but she wet her sh- panties, but did not dare to go to the toilet. She leaned her head against the lace doilies covering the back of the red plush seat. Facing her was a cato- uh, photography of a spa. She looked at the white hotel in the sea of fir trees. Well, that sort of life is also possible, she thought, remembering her last night of love on the squeaking mattress. Does anyone have the right to make love in a white hotel while dogs are chained to a post? (laughs) These goddamn Jews, like my mother, never stop moralizing that 10 years later, Under the almond tree in a London backyard, she began to write all of this down on paper. Her spelling was never any good. I had always thought of her as lovable, but somewhat simple. Yet she proved capable of thoughts like these. Once you have been to hell. Once you have been to hell. And it is always around the corner this place of nakedness where you are at the mercy of others well in this hell you don't give a damn about hair curlers and wet panties and reconciliation with the enemy all my life i thought i enjoyed reconciliation especially with the nastiest of my enemies i never had many hardly any who would bother or hate or hurt me, but I constantly dreamed of shaking hands with or hugging someone I despised. Well, to hell with all that. Beware of looking at the enemy in the eyes, my darling, or you might stop hating him and thus betray the dead. I am now a bad little girl Earlier I had been a good little girl, always helping those in need. For instance, my father was kicked out of Ishla and other sea resorts. Although he was an excellent father and physician, he could not help seducing his female patients even as they lay like chicken on his examination table. Now, I might help my father by cutting his toenails and that German officer with the two blue eyes behaved like a father to me or a son, no difference. Yet I hate him for having to love him, which I do. After all, he and his brothers burned my Cornelius and my mother and 80 others of my blood and flesh. I can never forget them. May God strike me dead if I do. And the next time around, oh, I hope I'll be dead by then and out of this confusion of hearts. But the next time around, I will smash their German faces with a hammer. Uh, 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 I'm a weak, 
I'm a stupid woman, afraid of slight aches, who wanted to be nice to everybody. My darling, beware of weak and stupid women once they lose their dread of hair curlers or slight eggs for their need to be nice, they become holy monsters sitting in that first class compartment in my wet panties. I wished I had been a witch. Oh, dear, where do these thoughts come from? The door of the compartment was wrenched open and another enemy came in. A German soldier, very young, why were they sending these children to the wars? And he brought my mother cabbage soup and a piece of gray bread. He sat down in the corner by the door and watched her eating. Chopped up bits of sausage were swimming in the grease. German cooking. My mother thought, ladling the brew. She wasn't half finished when she saw the other cattle train starting off to Auschwitz. She could not see any of the deportees, but she knew they were there, all her children. And she looked away in guilt, silently saying farewell to them, adding crazy little admonitions as befits a mother. Take care of yourselves. All right, get enough sleep and fresh air and don't drink water from the tap. Eat slowly and don't forget to write, children, even if it's only a postcard. Tell a dead child to write a postcard. She was nuts at that moment, absolutely nuts. And her tears came like her urine filled her incomparable blue eyes made her blind before rolling into the German soup. That goddamn Jewish sentimentality. Instead of staying cool and factual as befits a lady, she thought of the 4,030 would be dead and sprayed her juice all over that clean German compartment in grief over her so-called children. But what's the use of grief? Who is ever helped by grief except the whale makers? Well, I tell you, you who is helped by it, the murderers. That's who, for let me tell you, my darling, murder begins where grief has ceased to wet your pants or your eyes. Don't you like the soup? Oh, oh yes, yes, I do. Yet she gagged on it and dozed off. When she awoke, she saw her savior sitting in the opposite seat, polishing a plum, one of hers. Uh, forgive me going through your purse. I was hungry. Be my guest. Uh, did you see that the cabbage soup had some cut up sausage in it or didn't you notice? Uh, I'm a vegetarian in recent habit. Odd thing, but the thing of eating the flesh of death repulses me. You don't say so. Uh, started in Hamburg after a firestorm. Do you know Hamburg? No, no. Uh, I was in a restaurant and a chopped steak was served to me, rather artfully arranged, when suddenly I could see what it really was. A piece of a calf that once had grazed in a field, and the calf seemed to be looking at me. Now, how can anyone stoop so low, I said to myself, as to butcher a calf, chop it up and eat it? Well, what's one that's one way of looking at uh, it? Of course, one ought to go even further. Uh, does a plum feel pain as it chews it? <laughs> I don't think so. You are very kind, but I've read somewhere that if you pluck a lily, she would, if she had a voice, let out a scream. Sometimes I think I can hear all the lilies in the field screaming and the cabbages too. How far does one have to go to be one of the righteous before God? A what? There was a priest in the village I come from, 
a rather unsuccessful one. His congregation kept wandering. On certain Sundays, there were hardly more than five people lounging in the pools, bored to tears with his sermons. Well, he could comfort himself at nights when he could not sleep. Jesus loves the losers. He himself was a loser, as befits a God. The message of God is an outcry against vanity and success. All religion is grounded in failure, or let us say, since failure belongs to life, it must be sanctified. What I like about Christianity and Judaism, of course, as well, is that they are so realistic. They allow for failure. That is, they tolerate sin. They accept the weakness of man, the sweat of fear, for instance, in a garden before an arrest. What else have we got but our weakness? We can't even follow any of the famous commandments, and that really they really are not so hard to follow, are they? I mean, what is so difficult about resisting the temptation to murder, don't you think so? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> well, then one day, the plum tastes really good. Something nasty happened in the village. The local draper, a Jew, was caught, not by thugs, but precisely by those five faithful who still attended the services and was beaten to death with alpine walking sticks. They buried him hastily, on the sewage farm. Only his widow was allowed to attend, but his grave was open, found the following Saturday and the body gone. The same night, the priest's chimney was belching smoke, a remarkable thing for his housekeeper was known to be away and the priest who had very wide hands could not cook. The man was incapable of menial tasks on that Sunday. Maria's ascension, the church was reasonably full. A dozen little girls were receiving their confirmation. They were all white lace, but it wasn't white for long. As soon as they had received his body and his blood, they began to throw up over there themselves, vomiting not bread and wine, but what had been served to them, namely real chunks of flesh and real blood. And instead of a sermon celebrating transubstantiation, the priest yielded the congregation, if you want to eat God, then by God, I'll make you eat his flesh and drink his blood, the real thing, the real thing, the real thing. Horrible story, isn't it? Yes. Um, when we are arrived, I'll have to turn you over to the local police so they can check out your passport and you'll be deported again. And I don't believe I can save you more than once. <laughs> Meanwhile, however, I must go to the toilet. Good luck. Uh, plums never fail, as St. Paul might say. Um, the way things are, I'll be staying on the toilet for quite a while. Is that so? If I'm not back before we get there, make yourself scarce. Jesus resides in my bowls, if you pardon the expression. <sighs> she never saw him again. Though she waited a full five minutes after the train had come to stop at the West Station. No one paid attention to her, so she took a tram to her sister Martha. Where have you been? Her sister cried out. Instead of replying, my mother asked for a cup of coffee. It's ten o'clock, goddammit! Uncle Julius bellowed from his bed and came into the living room wearing striped pajamas. He was cut crazy and choleric too. What the hell do you mean by, by, by turning up so late? Had I known, I would have asked Samo Österreicher to play instead of you. My mother had already sat down, taking off her good black hat, the one with wax flowers on the rim, for the first time that day. The sister asked again, where have you been all day? Well, this I will tell you. The hell you will. I had enough of stories from you and your crazy son, George, who swindled his way into London, where he now sits telling lies 
of the BBC badgering virgins. No, 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 something happened to her, said the sister. But Uncle Julius, not partial to the tragic sense in life, was already at the table, wiping off crumbs, cutting a cigarette in half, putting the stuff into the, his holder and lightening it. My mother stared at him, stared at the smoke, coffee cup, the lace tablecloth, all those banal things that decorate hell. My son exaggerates from time to time, but he doesn't lie. Shut up and start dealing. They played gin for a couple of hours. By midnight, when they paused for a cold supper with tea, my mother had won 35 pengers. She had every reason to be pleased. Well, can you both hear me? Yes. That was a, a, a truly, uh, a, that was a, a truly wonderful, a wonderful, wonderful reading. Um, thank you, thank you both for um, for being with us and um, giving you this, this exceptional uh, 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 rendering. I'm very moved uh, just listening uh, to it uh, again and. Uh, it is truly an extraordinary um, achievement. Um, Thomas, um, thank you so much for arranging the text. Uh, um, the translation of George Tarbury's My Mother's Courage uh, um, was adapted by you for two actors. Uh, the great uh, uh, Jack uh, Sipes uh, translated it, who was only have been in contact. He couldn't be with us. So thank you so much for doing this. Again, we would like to thank our partners, the Staatstheater Kassel, the uh, National Jewish Theater Foundation, and the Holocaust uh, Theater International Initiative, um, both Arnold uh, Mittelmann and Elvin Goldfarb, and uh, Tony Torn from Torn Space, where we hopefully will show this work um, and everybody, at least in New York City, can come. It's gonna be a very small reading. It's very limited, 15 uh, viewers in a room. Um, it is a truly an uh, extraordinary uh, work. So really, um, um, thank you uh, for, for, for creating this for us. I think, as far as I know, it's the only reading of Tabori's Mother, My Mother's Courage um, here uh, on planet Earth on Holocaust Day. And we really would like to thank, you know, also Sigur and Schneider Kettner, both of you, as far as I know, it's the first time a Zoom reading, first time in another language, in English. Uh, it was remarkable. It was uh, beautiful. It was true. So really, really, both of you, thank you for going on that uh, adventure uh, with us. Um, we're going to now morph into a small discussion afterwards. And we have with us uh, Martin Kagel is a professor of Germanic and Slavic studies at the University of Georgia, Tabori specialist. He published about him, who um, will enter, um, and I hope Andy uh, will be able to, to roll him in again. Thank you so, so, so much uh, for, um, for uh, joining us, and um, I hope um, that. Um, we're going to uh, be able to um, have a, a small discussion. So, um, Martin, before we uh, come to you, um, uh, uh, Thomas, how was it performing the text in English? Uh, uh, Sigrun wants to say something first. Sigrun, yes, only, please. I only want to say thank you. Toda rabba ve shalom a goldo. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, Sigrun. Thank you. Well, the, it was, it was, um, it was quite a work. If the two of us played this together, maybe this, your people should know that for 26 years at several theaters all over Germany in a scenic, in a scenic version. But this was the first time we did it in a foreign language and to do something in a foreign language, even if, if it's only a reading is a sort of insecure ground. So we are very happy we got, we got over it. 
That's fantastic. And I know you flew around also in Spain to an island uh, to meet Sigron um, with all the Corona things that are happening. Thomas, you were the intendant of Staatstheater Castle for over 15, 16 years, where you had opera, ballet, drama. Um, why did you choose this Tabori play to perform yourself? You're a trained actor. Why did you choose the Tabori play? Uh, and why did you perform it for over two decades? Well, I could give a very long answer. In my family history, the, the Jewish history played a big part. And I'm a, also a very big friend of what we call the Jewish humor. I think these people need it more than any other people in the world after what happened to them through history. And a certain sort of humor is sort of, I think Sigmund Freud said, um, every joke is an epitaph to a died feeling, okay? So with a certain sort of humor, you can, you can get over things better, to put it simple. And what I like very much about this true story is that um, a little bit like a Trojan, Trojan horse, um, there's told a lot about 4,031 people going in a train to Auschwitz and only one survives. But by telling her story, you still tell the story of the other 4,030. And I think that's uh, an intelligent thing. We also, what we liked is that um, when, when we do it on stage, actually it starts like a solo reading by me and then the mother appears like a du book, you know, like in, when in Jewish stories, the, 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 the story gets strong and sometimes figures come back to life. And then the mother is coming and disturbing him all the time and says, come on, it was totally different. I mean, you know, if two people tell the same story, um, it's, never, it's never the same story. And the, the, the interesting thing is, is that relationship between the son and the mother remains. When we did it the first time, my 25-year-old daughter wasn't born and I was 40. Now I'm 60, 20, 66 and Zygrun got a little older also. But the relation between son and mother always remains. And that's why I think it still works that we can do it. And it's a great pleasure for us to do it. And we are looking, by the way, very much forward. It works out uh, to do it, uh, to do the scenic version in New York. But I don't want to talk too much now. You heard my voice already. <laughs> thank you. Thank you again, uh, Thomas. <laughs> Uh, uh, Martin, thank you uh, so much for joining us. I know you're in transit. Uh, you are um, actually flying. You're in an airport. But um, you said this is important. I would like to participate. Um, so, Martin, um, you looked professionally in your work as a, as a literary scholar, as a professor of literature, but also theater, um, at the work of Tabori. Uh, why is he important? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to participate, Frank. And uh, I just uh, caught the very end of the performance and I also thought it was quite moving and I wanna commend uh, the performers. Uh, this text, I think, stands out among Tabori's texts for many reasons. I can speak to that later, but uh, why is Tabori's work important? I think Tabori is the most uh, consequential person and the development of epic theater in the context of the Holocaust. So Tabori is well known as a playwright who sort of focused not exclusively, but uh, primarily on the Holocaust. Uh, and uh, I think he's indebted to Brecht in many ways. I mean, over the course of his career, you can see there's an engagement with Brechtian techniques. Uh, I think when uh, he emerged in Germany in 1969 with the performance of uh, the cannibals, Die Kannibalen at the Schiller Theater Werkstatt, he, um, he offered kind of a third way between two other ways that had been proposed in theater, one of which was kind of theatrical realism, like the deputy, the Stellvertreter, the other one was documentary theater, uh, so Peter Weiss's investigation. What Tabori was trying to do was turn the theater into 
a, a place of commemoration uh, and engagement at the same time. Uh, and I think that was, you know, he found a way in a non-representational way to engage audiences with the victims of the Holocaust, to create a moment of empathy without trivializing the experience. Uh, uh, and uh, that was very complicated, but he was very successful. So, and in this uh, play uh, or this text, I should say, because it exists in four different forms, um, you know, as a film, as a radio play, as a, a, a theater play, and uh, as a prose text originally, as a novella. Um, in this play, he he also, you know, there there are many Brechtian techniques at work. Uh, one of the most obvious is that uh, the story is narrated by the son and then the action in part played out or reenacted uh, by the two participants. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the last line or one of the last lines, my son exaggerates occasionally, but he's not a liar. Uh, that's that kind of form of mediation. Yeah, it is, it is truly an uh, extraordinary uh, work highly um, theatrical and I think Thomas is right the mother appears like a dibok who you know uh, is in his back of his mind and looking over his shoulder um, uh, Thomas um, uh, what comes to your mind when you hear uh, uh, about uh, George Taborian performing it in German towns you played it for a long time what were the reactions of the audiences um. Uh, that's always weird to say that yourself, but the reactions were very good because obviously Tabori found a form and to tell the story in a way that you are not sort of overwhelmed by guilt, but that you can be touched and that the story reaches you. I mean, a lot of people then get the information also that it is the true story of the mother. She, she really wrote it down a little bit like a diary at first and then the sudden made this made this first uh, prosa version um tabori wrote a lot of plays i mean he wrote a he wrote a famous play called mein kampf mm -hmm. which uh, um, my struggle yes. which is a, my struggle after the book which which shows that um him as an unsuccessful artist in in vienna where he, they didn't accept him at the at the art school, uh, the world history would probably gone different if they would have taken him at the art school. And he's helped by a Jew in an asylum who who takes care of him and looks for him. It's a very strange construction. If you know later what 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 then happened, um, you know, actually um, people uh, liked it. We also did it often for younger people, for people from the age of fifteen on. Now we had it for the first time in one performance for younger people that this Vogue question came, isn't the scene in the, in the cattle car not a raping? And shouldn't this, uh, is this sort of still politically correct to tell this? But I think we can explain in a very good way why it is. And Zikun is very good in those discussions then also. And there is this, mm -hmm. Uh, this there is this near thing between that and erotic, uh, as we all know. Yeah, so um, I think even this is correct. By the way, when we do it on stage, she's not seen. It's totally dark on the stage, and there's only one little shine um, of the of the sun over her eyes. That's all. And I tell it through a mic, like you only hear it. Okay. But the, the, the experience I, I, is, yeah, is good. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember a, a great New York theater artist, John Jasron, who said, so partly from a Jewish family, he said when he was in Germany, so many people read books and knew about it, but nobody really wanted to go to Auschwitz and see it, you know? And I think this play this, does. If, uh, I, if, I, if, I may, if I may quote it. If I may quote an Israeli psychoanalyst, I think he said a very intelligent thing. He said, of course, the Germans will never forgive us Auschwitz. Yeah. Because you don't want to feel <laughs> guilty. Yeah, it's true. So this is also important 
um, um, to, to, to remember and also to engage. Uh, Martin, uh, what role do you think uh, can theater play? And is that approach uh, successful? I know that you also, you know, survey novels or poems or others, you know, how do, what do you see the role of this theater in uh, remembering also on such a day like today? Well, um, sorry about the background noise. Uh, well, I, I maybe I just briefly uh, comment to what you just discussed. Um, so I think um, you know female sexuality is very central both to Tabori's work and to the play, and it appears you know when you look at the uh, narrative closely or the dramatic action like the dialogue, you can see that like motifs that hint at eroticism or a love relationship appear throughout the text. Uh, you know, when she is picked up by uh, the Hungarian police, for instance, you know, Tabori writes, it was at the space where like, young lovers, uh, the place where young lovers normally met, for instance, you know, and uh, the plums that are discussed uh, in, the, in the play and uh, uh, in the prose section are a symbol of female sexuality, actually, female gender. And also the name of Kurash, it's from Gummelshausen. Uh, where it refers to the female genitals as well. So the scene in the cattle car is offensive in maybe perhaps in some people's eyes, but it's very central to the character of the mother. It has to be there. And it fits also very well with Tabori's aesthetics, which is, as you know, Tabori talked of his theater frequently as a theater of embarrassment, like uh, Theater der Peinlichkeit. Peinlich meaning both embarrassing, but also painful. And I think he wants to create this discomfort among the audience, uh, the spectatorship, through scenes like that, because uh, we don't want to be too comfortable with the entire story. Uh, and uh, the moments of transgression are very important. So this said, well, what is the role of theater in commemoration? I think what Tabori thought the role of theater was, or the important significance of theater was that, um, uh, it created a, a space, a ritual space, where audience and uh, performers would come together in an act of commemoration and engagement with important questions, such as the ones posed uh, by the Holocaust. And um, I think he believed very much in kind of the fleeting art form, which is like that actually things happen in that moment in the theater. Uh, because what happens in an evening at the theater cannot be reproduced because every evening is different when you attend a performance. And uh, creating these like, uh, you know, moments of um, transformation uh, or a transformational form of engagement, that this is what theater can deliver up to this day. Uh, and so it's, it's a different form than, you know, a different art form than watching a movie, obviously, or um, um, uh, reading a book. Uh, I think Tabori was interested very much in a, in a kind of therapeutic form of theater uh, that had actually impact on the audiences that participated. And uh, I mentioned Brecht before, I think uh, he, he used Brecht to uh, create very transformative moments. Uh, I mean, Thomas mentioned Mein Kampf, for example, the play. I mean, in the original performance in Vienna, Tabori himself played uh, uh, Lobkowitz, the cook who believes he is God. And in the final scene, he scrubs the floor with a toothbrush. And as you know, Vienna, when the March, when the Nazis came to Vienna, they made Jews scrub the pavement. Uh, clean the pavement, and Tabori kind of reenacts that moment, but in a obviously completely futile form. And it's moments like those, like I mean, there are many like this that mm. he creates that happen at that time in the theater that transform the audience. And I think that yeah. you know was largely what he believed was the unique role the theater could play uh, in you know among the art forms that are available. Yeah, yeah, it is quite. Uh, uh quite shocking when one really thinks it was all reality, the sun was shining, you know, it were a normal day, banal things as 
sit in the textbook on the table and older I get more horrified I am learning more and more about it it's uh, the contrary of one might think Thomas uh, um, surely coming to an end but what was for you uh, the challenge to do it in English what uh, about translation about engaging speaking uh, how, how was the experience for you as an actor to represent George uh, as I said it was it was uh, a tough work even if it was only a reading um, because as an actor you language is very important for you and I, I'm an actor since 45 uh, years in German and not in English, but um, it was a very good experience. It was in a way, that sounds a little bit egoistic, it was a very good English lesson for me also to, <laughs> to do this work. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to point out maybe two more things. I think Tabori was very intelligent in, I think what we don't really go through, what experience we don't really go through we have to repeat and repeat again. And he helps us to go through things in a, in a playful way, in a humorously way. And I, I want to tell maybe for the end a story that impressed me very a lot and I found it very funny from Tabori. Uh, he once told in a German um, TV interview that when he was in his 40s in, in Los Angeles and he was good friend with Marlene Dietrich and whatever, he started to make a psychoanalysis because everybody made a psychoanalysis in these uh, circles at that time. And he told the psychoanalyst, the female psychoanalyst, a lot of dreams. And after a year, and she interpreted the dreams, of course. And after a year, uh, he confessed to the lady that I said, I said, I must say now that I didn't dream all those dreams. I only, um, they, they are all literature. Yeah, <laughs> I only, <laughs> it was a fantasy. And then the psychoanalyst said, well, Mr. Tabori, if you think it doesn't tell much about you, what you sort of fantasize, um, that's your problem. And then he said, and that was the moment where I started to trust the therapy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. like the story yeah, of yeah. so what you make up actually is in a way um, a real thing and this in a way this fairy tale what he tells which is the as you pointed out the exact opposite of what really happened but it helps us to, to digest to understand and, and, and I, I forgot one more thing if I, mm -hmm. if I mentioned that um, because you talked about the banality also that he is so honest that he's saying my mother was bored when they were waiting for the for the next train, okay, at the at the gate of hell, she was bored and wanted to play cards or whatever. I mean, you all remember what how how uh, um, Anna Arendt was attacked when she wrote the book *The Banality of Evil*. But sometimes even horrible things are very banal, and we gotta face that. And I think this play helps that. Yeah. And yeah. the book finally, I mean, showed that it was right. But you remember that she was um, under huge attacks from from a lot of uh, from from the Jewish community at, at yeah. the beginning. Yeah, she, she yeah. wrote this she book had to about defend Eichmann. herself. Um, again, yeah. yeah, it is a remarkable, I think also we should point out Tabori was well known in American theater, also on Broadway, he, had a, he did Brecht on Brecht, he did a compilation of uh, Brecht poems, of excerpts from his plays, uh, a kind of uh, collaged, uh, uh, assemblage with um, his famous interview with the um, Committee for Anti-American Activities, where he then left overnight the next day. So he had big influence. Bob Dylan uh, came to that show and it said it was so important to his work. Nina Simone rewrote uh, the, uh, the Pirate Jenny song. And uh, so it was a big influence. And um, uh, we also were in contact with Anna Feinberg in Heidelberg in Germany, Martin Israel, many others. Um, is there a renaissance on the horizon of the work of Tabori, Martin, do you think? Is their interest increasing? He now died uh, some, some time ago. Um, or um, do you feel he is still um, um, overlooked? I think there's a lot of interest in Tabori's work uh, worldwide, uh, and a kind of resurging interest 
I mean, Tabori was not a playwright like Brecht who, uh, you know, left behind a theory, a form of theater that others could adopt. He was very eclectic in his approach to theater. He used whatever was useful to him. So it's very difficult to follow in his footsteps because he's a very unique persona uh, and he didn't have, you know, an entirely distinct style. The said, I think, uh, you know, people are very interested in his aesthetics because they connect very strongly to kind of performance aesthetics of the 1960s in the United States, uh, which were his formative years theatrically and, uh, you know, fall well within kind of the realm of, you know, what is termed post-dramatic theater. Uh, so I think he has a lot to offer. Uh, it's just, you know, his plays, I don't, I, um, his work is very centered in the time that it is, when the spaces that it is performed in. And so uh, that, that kind of hinders the reception a little bit, but I think in the US again, like I feel, People are very interested in his work. Uh, I mean, I can, if you allow me to put in a plug in for a, a collection of essays that I just co-edited with my colleague, David Salz, that's coming out with Michigan University Press in February, so uh, in about two weeks. And uh, people who reviewed the essays were extremely enthusiastic uh, about the work and uh, are very interested in learning more about it. So I think, yeah. Uh, there's a significant Tabori reception in Israel as well. So uh, his plays are performed there as well. So I think uh, in, the, you know, in the realm of Holocaust theater, he is a, a very important playwright and performer. Yeah, yeah, he really, really is. And uh, I hope he will be able to see us in his never been performed um, in, I think in New York City as far as we know and once said about Tom Stoppard she said the mystery of a play you discover when you do it when you rehearse it and then when you show it it's not right. really in the text it's also not fully in a reading they did an amazing job it's just stunning what we heard but I hope uh, we will be able to also you know see that what that cannot be explained under sort of transmitted that perhaps will emerge in a performance, you know, between two actors in a space, also in a, a, a small space. So I think uh, we've come to an end. Thank you all for participating, um, especially, of course, you, Martin, then, uh, for um, taking the time out. Uh, Dan Thomas and Sigrun, it was just a brilliant uh, a rehearsal and I think also you know voices from Europe who reminds us of, of what is important of what is significant what we have to be afraid of it's a great warning it happened overnight as Tabori in the play said you know that she said didn't I know you hey aren't you my friend and he says no I wouldn't want to talk to her anymore things shift fast and I think we are in a moment worldwide globally um, where uh, things are shifting and we hope and we hope that this was a contribution that things move in the wrong direction and not in the small one, a small homeopathic pill. Again, thanks to everybody involved, Staatstheater Kassel, the National Jewish Theater Foundation, Holocaust Center, Holocaust Theater International Initiative, Synagogue Center, Felsberg with Christopher Willing, uh, Lily Ackerman, who also helped us to go and polish the text a bit, and Jake Sipes, Jack Sipes, who was really said go ahead use my text adapt however you want i'm thrilled that it will be happening so thanks to howlround for for hosting us again i think this is a very important day uh, to remember all these millions and millions of lives lost and we truly cannot really comprehend and imagine uh, this unspeakable horror um, the world witnessed but this is at least an idea for an idea how to think about and how to approach it and i do think that the um Get a grasp to begreifen in the German say to kind of put your hands around something that's and not cannot be really truly understood. So thank you all. Thanks to our listeners. Thank you for listening in. We know how many readings now there are online. We have stayed away for a year and a half or two. This is our very first one, but we thought on this day um, we uh, should make that uh, contribution. Martin, again, thank you, Thomas, Sigun, everybody. And Andy Lerner for doing this here behind the scenes, for putting it together, VJ and Thea at HowlRound and everybody at the Staatstheater Kassel who helped to put this together. Goodbye, thank you, and I hope you will follow us here at the Siegel Center and perhaps uh, look out for uh, the Torn page, Tony Torn also. Thank you for him who offered to host this uh, production. We hope that uh, Corona and Omicron will help, will allow us. To, 
uh, to 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 present it to an interested audience here in New York. 